welcome to CG and thank you for joining us. Uh, this evening's event uh, stands at the confluence of two themes that are central, in fact, to what CG does. One is the uh, changing contours of global governance. Uh, just last week, uh, we produced uh, with Chatham House uh, a report on uh, our thoughts on the future of the governance of the internet. And one can think of many other areas in which uh, CG and others work, such as sovereign debt, in which um, the nature of the players, the number of the players, and the nature of the issue is changing, so that we now think about multi-stakeholder processes, for example, to, to govern ungoverned spaces in globalization, where previously we might have limited ourselves to a narrow range of actors. So that's one. The other is uh, work that is also uh, long-standing at CG on issues related to Africa. And in the last uh, three or four years, uh, we've been putting a point on that, and many of you might have seen some of the books and, and uh, publications that we've produced in the area of um, regional solutions um, to conflict prevention and conflict management in Africa. In fact, for the last two days, uh, a group of experts and scholars has been meeting at CG to think through the next phase of that work and, and plan a book that follows on, on a very highly regarded book on, on that subject that, that was published last year. And we, we thought we'd take advantage of the presence of many of our friends uh, to, to do an event on the future of diplomacy. Central to all of this, by the way, at CG is my colleague, uh, Fen Hampson, who's the director of our Global Security and, Pol and uh, Politics Program. So Fen will be leading the way and introducing our friends and experts, and uh, I hope you enjoy the discussion. Fen. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to uh, introduce our three panelists. Uh, we're going to be having a conversation on the future of diplomacy in a chaotic world, and I can't think of three better people and more qualified people and more clever people to uh, lead our conversation. Uh, to my far right, uh, Chester Crocker, He's a distinguished fellow with CG's Global Security and Politics Program. He also is the James R. Schlesinger Professor of Strategic Studies at Georgetown University and serves on the board of its Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. From 1981 to 1989, Chet served as Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. He was responsible for leading the diplomacy that uh, produced the treaties signed by Angola, Cuba, and South Africa in New York in December 1988. Those agreements uh, resulted in Namibia's independence and the withdrawn, uh, withdrawal of foreign forces from Namibia and Angola. Uh, Chad has had a very distinguished career. He's also served as chairman of the board of the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, from 1992 to 2004. Uh, he continued to serve as a board member for many years. That's where actually I first got to, uh, to know him. He served as a mediator, uh, mediation advisor in the United Nations and the State Department in uh, such places as Western Sahara, Kosovo, the Philippines, and Syria. He chairs the board of the G3 Good Governance Group and is also a founding member of the Glo Global Leadership uh, Foundation. Uh, to, uh, to Chet's left is Pamela All, who is a senior fellow with CG's Global Security and Politics Program and is uh, leading our project uh, examining Af Africa's regional conflict management uh, capacities and gaps. Uh, she serves as a senior advisor uh, to the United States Institute of Peace, where she was uh, founding provost of the Institute's Academy for International Conflict Management and Peacebuilding. 
She's on the board of Women in International Security, a senior associate at Facilitating Peace, a consulting network of conflict resolution specialists. Uh, Pamela uh, has uh, directed conflict transformation and capacity building programs in Sudan, Iraq, Israel, Palestine, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, and Bosnia. And prior to joining the United States Institute of Peace, uh, where she worked for many years, uh, she was at the Rockefeller Foundation and uh, a number of other uh, international uh, educational and uh, 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 cultural uh, think tanks. Um, last, but by no means least, uh, Andrew Thompson, who many of you may know. Uh, he is a local in every sense of the word. Uh, he's a professor, adjunct uh, uh, professor of political science at uh, the University of Waterloo. Uh, he um, uh, is chair of uh, Amnesty International uh, Canada, uh, and for many years served uh, on uh, the board of uh, Amnesty International. He's the co-host of Inside the Issues, CG's weekly international affairs podcast, which I think is probably where many of you uh, have seen him. He's the author and co-editor of four books, uh, Fixing Haiti, In Defense of Principles, NGOs and Human Rights in Canada, Critical Mass, The Emergence of Global Civil Society, uh, his latest book, and I love the title, On the Side of Angels, Canada and International Human Rights Law, which will be coming out uh, sometime uh, later uh, this year. Uh, he is uh, also a senior fellow at CG and um, uh, is on the advisory editorial board of Global Civil Society uh, and uh, uh, Global Civil Society Report. Um, as well as uh, many other uh, non-governmental organizations in, which, uh, in whose work uh, he's evolved. We're going to have a conversation and then we're going to uh, invite you to uh, join the conversation. I'm going to kick it off with a few questions. I'm going to sit down uh, so that I'm not giving an exam to uh, my <laughs> colleagues. Um, and uh, 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 our dis discussion is going to be a wide-ranging one, but uh, perhaps I could begin. Uh, Winston Churchill uh, once said that jaw, jaw is better than war, war. And by that he meant uh, diplomacy should be the preferred means of settling international disputes. Um, I guess, you know, as we look at the turbulent world we're living in, and uh, the many conflicts in today's trouble spots that don't seem to be getting any better. Is there enough jaw-jaw taking place? And if there isn't, why isn't it uh, taking place? So Chet, perhaps you'd like to uh, uh, kick off the conversation and then I'll invite uh, Pamela and Andrew to offer their own reflections. Well, thank you, Finn. I guess the most important thing about diplomacy and talking to another party is not that you're talking, it's what you say to them. So jaw-jaw is kind of an open-ended idea. Um, and, and talking to adversaries, talking to difficult actors, that's okay, but you've got to figure out what you're going to say. The second point I'd make is, is that you need to have some, something behind your jaw-jaw. You need to have some strength. You need to have some allies. You need to have a coalition of like-minded. And it, it helps to have a little leverage when you're doing jaw-jaw. That's the way I'd start the, the conversation. Pamela, what are your thoughts? You've worked in the uh, non-governmental civil society sector. You've uh, uh, been deployed in many hot spots around the world. Um, you've done a lot of jaw-jaw yourself. Are we doing enough jaw-jaw? <laughs> Never enough jaw jaw. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in some ways, I, I uh, agreed with Chet um, in that you, you know it does depend on um, who you are and what you're saying. But um, talking is always important. But you may not be the right person to talk. You may not have the right 
uh, institutional support to talk. There are lots of elements that go into this complicated mix of talking. Um, but I think, you know, in, in the end, I think we're all very much in favor of some kind of engagement, even with people you don't like. Uh, because you don't really know what they think unless you talk to them. You can read about them in the newspaper, but there's nothing like actually having a conversation. So both, both of you have talked about uh, the importance of not just talking, but stressing the importance of how you talk and who you talk to and who leads the talking. But let's try to get specific. Andrew, where do, do we need more diplomacy of the kind that Chet and Pamela have talked about in your opinion. Is it Syria? Is it Libya where a peace process seems to be falling apart? Uh, there are many parts of the world that uh, uh, at least in the abstract might benefit from more jaw-jaw. Um, absolutely, and I'm a big fan of having normalized diplomatic relations with countries even if you don't like them. And um, I think it, you know, Iran would be a good example. Of Iran. The, Iran, mm -hmm. where um, for decades now, really since the, the revolution of the late 70s, where the West and Iran have been at odds with each other and there's, uh, there's mistrust in the relationship, there's a lack of empathy. And uh, reestablishing diplomatic relations uh, I think is, is absolutely crucial because you, you want to have people on the ground who can make sense of a situation for themselves and not have to rely on the Turks or the Saudis to tell you what's happening in Iran. Um, so I think you know, that would be a very concrete example of, of um, establishing strong or, or beginning the process of establishing relations with, with Iran. Cuba, I, th I would make the Cuba. same case. Um, and I think those were two very important initiatives of the, of the, in recent years. Mm. So Chet, you were actually on the ground uh, when you were Assistant Secretary of State. Uh, uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, you were the chief negotiator and architect of the Angola-Namibia Peace Accords. Um, in the uh, late 1980s, uh, those accords uh, brought peace to uh, a deeply troubled part of the African subcontinent. Uh, they've actually, unlike many peace accords, not unraveled. Uh, it's a much uh, stabler part of the world. Uh, it has other problems, uh, but um, uh, you can't uh, place those problems on the burden of the uh, chief uh, negotiator. Um, as you look back on your experience uh, uh, bringing diplomacy uh, to uh, a deeply troubled neighborhood. Um, are there any lessons that are relevant to the 21st century? Uh, I don't mean to date you, mm -hmm. uh, but, um, uh, you know, uh, some would say, you know, we're in a completely different world. Today's conflicts are completely different from uh, the 20th century and uh, the peacemaking efforts that you were involved in. Well, I think some things some things change and, and some things stay the same. So one lesson is you need leverage to be effective as a negotiator and a mediator. And leverage comes from coherence. You need coherence in your home institution. I spent a good deal of my time, maybe 40 for 50% of it, keeping the troops assembled and united on the home front. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. You but appeared you before the U.S. Congress a lot of times. I remember The seeing U.S. You on Congress, yes. Uh, mm. People who thought the State Department's policy was getting into bed with Marxists or others who thought we were getting into bed with racists. And, and so, you know, we were carrying water on both shoulders and mm. the media was uh, up in arms some of the time. So it was quite exciting. But then there's also coherence and leverage needed with, uh, with other players. We borrowed a lot of leverage at that time. So that's one lesson. I think it's kind of universal. We don't see much of that coherence and leverage in Syria today, mm. for example. Another lesson uh, is the vital importance of human agency. Leaders make a difference. And that's a universal lesson over time, I think. So I, I don't think it's really 
you're not dating me with that, with that question, <laughs> then. Um, so, so think about it in the modern context and ask yourself, in Ukraine, is Vladimir Putin somebody that wants to make peace in that region, or does he live on frozen or not so frozen conflict? You know, so that's, that's a lesson. A thir third lesson, and I'll stop, because <laughs> there's probably a lot of things we want to talk about. Don't give your policy a name. Now, back in the day, our policy got called constructive engagement. And, and nothing's wrong with constructive engagement, but if you give your policy a name, people will say, every time something awful happens, that's the result of constructive engagement. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I suggest that if, if diplomats are thinking about all this, just say we're conducting our policy. Don't give it a name. <laughs> we, we have a foreign minister who has given his foreign policy a name that's called responsible conviction uh, or principled conviction. So uh, maybe we'll take, uh, or ask Andrew to take that advice to, uh, to Ottawa. Sure. Uh, okay. Um, Pamela, um, you've worked uh, in the not-for-profit center uh, uh, with the United States of Institute of Peace, with NGOs, uh, uh, as I said, in Afghanistan when I was introducing you, Pakistan, Philippines, elsewhere. You've also written extensively about your experiences uh, uh, with those non-governmental organizations. Could you tell us a little bit about what it is that NGOs do when they get into the peace, peacemaking business? And, you know, we've just heard a, a distinguished uh, American diplomat uh, tell us uh, about official diplomacy, but what about unofficial diplomacy? Why do we need it? Why is... Uh, civil society important uh, to peacemaking? Well, this is a, actually a growing story. I mean, if you look back, way back into the 20th century, um, <laughs> you know, NGOs really didn't play a very prominent role in peacemaking until probably the 1990s. There were some isolated um, incidences, but it was really the 1990s with the end of the Cold War and the opening of space for people who were expert in these areas that, frankly, the official um, actors didn't know that much about either, um, that they were able to come in and find, find a place and, and be helpful in a lot of conflicts that um, you would have been surprised to find them in ten, 10 years before. I mean, and one example of it is a, um, an Italian charity called the Community of Sant'Egidio that turned out to be the principal um, mediator in Mozambique in the end of the, the Mozambican War in, that ended in the 1990s. So that had more or less n never happened before. Mm -hmm. um, and I may not be 100% right on that, but essentially that was a, 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 um, a singular case at the time. Now you find NGOs actually are established mm. for the purpose of going in and um, being helpful in a, a, a peacemaking process. And I put it that way rather than they act as principal mediators because very rarely now do you find a principal mediator except perhaps the UN. Um, now you find many, many institutions on the ground acting together. And so NGOs have found a, a, play, a, a, some, a, a role to play in this space, um, but it's, it's not been as easy as I think they thought in the 1990s. Um, official actors are still, um, you know, probably by and large the, the preferred mediators of choice uh, among parties who are fighting, and remember, it's the parties who are fighting who hire the mediator, not the mediator who finds the parties. So um, NGOs have found uh, a role often in supporting more official processes, um, and they've become much smarter in doing that, um, as they've had experience over the last 20 years. They often know the, the actors, the players better. They know the situation on the ground. There's a lot they can bring. Um, they cannot bring um, 
either much aid or much threat or use of force if parties don't really want to make peace. So they often need a more you know, powerful actor um, to be the principal. And, and do they work alongside governments, instead of governments, or against governments? I mean, give us some sense of how they fit into official peacemaking processes, because you often hear about NGOs who are in the peacemaking business, who are trying to get funding from the Canadian government so that they can go off to Israel-Palestine or to South Sudan to uh, engage communities. Um, but you sort of sometimes wonder, well, how does that fit into an official peace process? Or if there isn't one, should they be doing this kind of thing? If there isn't an official peace process, should they be trying to lay the groundwork for peace? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. If they have the right relationships and they're not just looking for something to do. Mm -hmm. um, if there is an official process, um, uh, most NGOs now try to fit into that process. So you have um, NGOs like um, the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue in Geneva um, and um, the uh, Crisis Management Initiative, which is uh, out of Finland, who have actually designed their activities. So the Crisis Management Initiative has, has really designed its activities in Africa to support official processes, for instance, in in uh, the Central African Republic and other places that they're active. So um, you, you fairly rarely these days find NGOs that are trying to do it alone um, and uh, trying to set up a competition mm. with an official process. Mm. Um, but you certainly did see some of that in the 1990s. So that's where the reputation came from. Sure. Now we hear a lot about human rights and, and the importance of human rights in peacemaking efforts, uh, it's probably fair to say that whether you're an NGO doing peacemaking or a representative of the United States government doing peacemaking, you're not just dealing with nice guys, you're dealing with really bad guys. And bad guys who have blood on their hands and have been responsible for uh, atrocities, uh, if not directly, uh, indirectly, uh, because these are parties that are at war with each other. People are getting killed, civilians are getting killed. Where does human rights fit into the equation? And maybe, you know, Andrew, I'll start with you. Sure. You're uh, with Amnesty uh, International, uh, uh, the chair of Amnesty Canada. Um, you spend a lot of time promoting human rights. Uh, do we, do we sort of put it on the shelf and wait until peace has actually broken out before we start talking about human rights? Or do we kind of front load our peacemaking efforts with uh, a real attention and concern for human rights? Well, I think, um, I mean, for, for a long time, peace and rights were, or peace and justice were seen as, uh, in, in many cases, mutually uh, incompatible. Mm -hmm are mutually exclusive. And uh, what many human rights activists have argued is that, in fact, that's, that's a very short-term view of peace. And uh, it's really prioritizing expediency over anything that's, that's really sustainable. And what they often argue is that um, most peace agreements unravel within five years. And, and, and that, you know, unfortunately, is the norm. And often that's because rights considerations are not central to the peace process. And perhaps to build on, on Pamela's point, uh, in the 1990s, um, when, when uh, one of the strong criticisms of women from, coming from women's human rights organizations is that women were never at the table in peace negotiations. Their concerns were never on the agenda. Um, the victims of human rights violations were not at the table. And I think what NGOs have, have been able to do over the last few decades is really expand the items that are, um, that are part of peace processes and to make sure that any negotiations or any mediation is more inclusive. Because definitely in the 90s, it was, it was not at all inclusive. Now, Chet, uh, the United States government has uh, 
uh, pretty tough legislation about dealing with uh, individuals who uh, have blood on their hands, if I can put it crudely. Um, there are uh, various, uh, you know, prohibitions, certain groups are outlawed. Um, is this sort of emphasis on human rights and, and broader legislative efforts at the national level, and the United States is not alone by any means. Um, you know, we have similar legislation in Canada about <coughs> dealing with terrorist groups. Does that make the job of the peacemaker more difficult? I mean, if we, if we roll the camera back, you dealt with a lot of bad guys when you were doing mediation in Angola and Namibia. Could you have done your job with the kind of legislative uh, restrictions that are in place today? It would have been a little more complicated, I suspect. The negotiation that you're describing was between states. It wasn't within states, although it set the table for figuring out a formula for Namibia to transition to independence, and it laid the groundwork for Angolans to find each other, and ultimately for South Africans to find each other. But um, <clears throat> at the time, I was negotiating with political actors, governmental actors, that I would not want to bring home to dinner, um, any of them. I tried to bring one of them home for breakfast, and my wife said to me once, no, don't do that again. No. Don't do that again. So these, these were pretty difficult, nasty characters, and they all had blood on their hands. They were, it was intergovernmental. In today's world, though, you're absolutely right, Fan, that it's, it's quite complicated to negotiate with armed actors who, are, who find themselves on lists of proscribed actors because of their use of violence or because they're on a terrorism list. It makes it very complicated, and since many governments sign on to these lists of prescribed actors, those governments are inhibited unless they get a waiver of some kind that would enable them to talk. So, for example, the U.S. government is trying right now to figure out how to engage the Taliban. And it's a hard one, because the Taliban has been considered in some ways a terrorist movement, but it's also the former government of Afghanistan. So how do we deal with this? Well, the way we deal with it is that we have a waiver that enables diplomats uh, to talk in third countries to the, to the Taliban. Uh, in the absence of that, we'd have to rely on the Swiss and the Norwegians uh, or the Turks or a private organization like Pamela was describing, mm -hmm. or maybe an intelligence service. I'm, I'm sure that MI6 can talk to Hezbollah for example. I don't think the Foreign Office talks to Hezbollah. It's, it's, it's a complicated situation legally, and it creates all kinds of, of legal vulnerabilities. You can't take a terrorist to tea, <laughs> to put it bluntly, if the terrorist is on a list. Mm -hmm. I see a, a movie in the making there, <laughs> <laughs> the sequence to tea with Mussolini that I'm sure some of you have seen. <laughs> Tea with the terrorists. Um, Chet, Pamela, Andrew, during the 1990s, the United Nations, uh, with a couple of exceptions, was the uh, peacemaker par excellence and could chalk up some real successes in uh, bringing peace to uh, troubled neighborhoods. Uh, Cambodia, El Salvador, uh, Mozambique. There was a UN role uh, in, uh, in uh, Southern Africa as well. Uh, today, there are lots of UN peacekeepers in the field, well over 100,000. Um, but when you look at UN mediation efforts, whether it's Kofi Annan trying to uh, do something in Syria, um, uh, when you look at uh, a, a recurring sequence of failures in Cyprus, uh, your friend Joe Clark, Chet, uh, for a while was the UN Special Representative in Cyprus. Uh, he failed where many others had failed, uh, uh, and he was followed by Alvaro de Soto, uh, who also failed. Uh, that's not a hot conflict, it's a cold conflict, but it's still, there's no resolution. Uh, Sudan, uh, you know, that's uh, a case where there was a mediation effort, 
a peace agreement that's sort of fallen apart. Uh, Andrew, you alluded to this. Why is the UN having such a hard time? Is it not up to the job? Does it not have the right people? Uh, should somebody else be doing the heavy, heavy lifting? Uh, or are we dealing with, you know, a set of conflicts that nobody's really serious about resolving and nobody really wants to touch and nobody's really willing to support the UN when it goes into these places? Who'd like to take that on? Why don't you start off? Well, I'll start. <clears throat> The UN didn't fail in Cyprus. The EU failed in Cyprus. The UN had a fabulous compromise plan called the Kofi Annan plan. It was all ready to go. It came very close to being adopted. The EU pulled the plug on it by admitting Cyprus to EU membership without conditioning that admission of Cyprus to a settlement process. So I, I foursquare blame the EU for that one, not the UN. Um, you mentioned Syria. What is the UN? The UN is us. The UN is the P5. The UN is the member states. And if Syria has been a failure of UN mediation, it's because the great powers, the P5, the permanent five, and the Security Council are at loggerheads and fundamentally disagree. What's the UN to do in a situation like that? There's no coherence, the word I used at the outset. So don't blame the UN. Well, and, and uh, or don't just blame the UN. Um, and and I would say to you, I mean, the 1990s, I think, were, were a special decade for the, the reasons you've mentioned. The 90s were also a really bloody decade. And the UN failed in Rwanda. It failed in former Yugoslavia. It had very draconian sanctions on Haiti and Iraq. And so for all of the victories, there were some pretty big failures as well, and uh, the International Criminal Court, the, the special tribunals, the idea of the responsibility to protect, they're all born out of failure mm -hmm. in the 90s. So um, uh, it wasn't, you know, it, the UN I think has always struggled on some level with these, uh, with, with questions of mediation, and some conflicts are, are uh, easier to resolve than, than others. Um, the other thing that, that I would stress, and, and getting back to Chet's point about leadership, is that um, you know, Kofi Annan was a very strong secretary general. Mm -hmm. And his mediation in Kenya during the electoral crisis, um, 1,500 people died in that, in that crisis, but all of the signs were pointing to another Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And there was very early diplomatic intervention there. And, and that could have been a, hor a horrific situation. Um, but I think it goes to the point where you really need a very strong secretary general who has a lot of... Are you of pointing moral... fingers there? Well, I'm the just saying... Secretary general? Well, I, I'm <laughs> saying the, the current secretary general's term is up, and there will be a new secretary general mm -hmm. within a year. Mm -hmm. And it should be somebody who, who comes with a lot of... Uh, moral conviction and and who has a, a very strong and principled mm. commitment to peace. Mm. And I what? promise you, she will. She will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Pamela, your thoughts. But I think, I, I mean, I, actually the, the case of Kenya is very interesting because we tend to say, well, the, it's either the UN or nobody. But um, in Kenya, it was, Kofi Annan really was uh, asked by the AU um, it was an African process, and he <coughs> carried the, the legitimacy of the UN because of what he had been before. But he uh, was representing a regional organization. And um, I think we can start to look um, at other actors coming into some of these conflicts and being able to engage in the ways that it's more difficult for the UN to engage. Given that uh, practically all the conflicts now are civil conflicts, so there are always at least two sides, if not many, many more, um, you are gonna have splits in the Security Council in terms of who the various big powers support. And so it's difficult for the UN to, to gain traction in those kinds of conflicts. 
Um, partnerships are important. And, uh, so I'd now like to change the conversation a little bit, uh, move it a bit away from peacekeeping and mediation to uh, intervention and military intervention. Um, some months ago, uh, President Obama uh, put himself in the uh, confession box <laughs> in a much uh, publicized interview in Atlantic uh, Magazine uh, with Jeffrey Goldberg. And there he uh, expressed his uh, uh, ambivalence about uh, the Libyan operation uh, where uh, a number of NATO countries went into Libya and essentially tipped the scales in a bombing campaign that led to the uh, ousting of uh, Muammar, Dar uh, Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, the dictator of Libya, and he uh, seemed to sort of be pointing the fingers uh, at secretary, his former, his secretary of state at the time, Hillary Clinton, now running for the office of president of the United States, uh, his ambassador, Samantha Power, who, uh, uh, you know, had written a book, champion, championing military intervention uh, and, and uh, responsibility to protect doctrines, which are near and dear to the heart of Canadians since we uh, advanced some of those ideas back in the 90s mm -hmm. uh, when we uh, led a commission uh, uh, that uh, talked about the responsibility to intervene mm -hmm. if things are really bad. Um, what went wrong there? And, you know, is he right to say, uh, is the President of the United States right to say, maybe we shouldn't have gone in to avert a bloodbath. Maybe we should have just let Gaddafi stay in power. He was bad, but he wasn't nearly as bad as what we're seeing now in Libya. So, you're the human rights guy. Right. Um, you know, what's happened with R2P? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think it's, it's an idea that has uh, taken some bruising. And for a number of reasons, the, in cases where there has been action, like in Libya, mm -hmm. and it's gone uh, quite wrong, and then in cases where there hasn't been action, uh, like the situation in Darfur, where um, you know there is a there are mass atrocities unfolding and, and nothing's happening, and um, so I, I think it's it's any time, uh, I mean. I guess one of the thing I think one of the misconceptions about R2P is that it's it's only about military intervention. And in fact, in the original report of the commission that produced the idea, they were very clear that military intervention was always uh, should always be the last resort, and everything else should be. And, and it should only resort when every other option has been exhausted. But they did try to negotiate with Gaddafi, and they did, they did try a lot of diplomacy to get him to see the error of his ways. And, and I think, you know, in some cases, and, and perhaps per President mm -hmm. Obama felt this way, that mm -hmm. he was damned if he did and damned mm -hmm. if he didn't. And um, unfortunately, with some of these mm -hmm. civil conflicts, with either either course of action, you're still looking at massive losses of life, and um, and and again, that's perhaps where the international community can be much better at preventive work before the conflicts erupt. And uh, some of the recent initiatives uh, at the UN, like the Human Rights Upfront Initiative which is aimed at dealing with preventive, or looking at, at early warning mechanisms and acting quickly, um, hopefully. I mean, if, if enough is, resources are invested in prevention, then we won't have these Benghazi situations. Chet, could Libya have been prevented? Chet and Pamela, either, either one of you? Well, it's hard to prevent that. I mean, you, you had the... Arab Spring phenomenon, and there was copycat demonstrations going on in a number of capitals and cities across uh, the, the Arab world. Uh, I'm not sure how that could have been prevented. What could have prevented, been prevented, however, is a, an intervention that thought that what you could do is using um, a no-fly zone, overthrow a regime, and then go home and say, mission accomplished. <laughs> That was mindless. Now, of course, hindsight is perfect. Mm 
hindsight is perfect. Mm -hmm. But you have to ask yourself, what were they thinking in the National Security Council system in Washington? What were they thinking in London between the Foreign Office and MI6 and the military? What were they thinking in France? Did they think they could just go home after you've created a massive vacuum in a country that was a, a pillar of the status quo in the Sahel and the Maghreb and even further south into sub-Saharan Africa? It, it, uh, it sort of blows you away when you think about it. You, you can't... Same thing happened in Iraq. If you create a vacuum, somebody's going to fill it or it's going to become a contest. I agree. How um, do you fill it, Pamela? It, it, well, I, just to, to lend support to what Chet said, I mean, it, you know, the problem was the day after yeah. where we really didn't have a, a plan. And I guess this, to make a more general point, and maybe because of Brexit last week, I'm thinking about this a lot more, but we seem to have entered into an era of black swans. I mean, black swans were supposed to be the things that you didn't expect because they so rarely happened, but now they're happening on a, on a more regular basis. And, um, you know, 9-11, um, the rise of ISIS, um, and then, you know, what, as I said, what happened in, in, um, in uh, the UK last week. So we're not expecting these things, so we don't plan for them. Um, and I think we just have to get a lot better at, you know, what used to be called contingency planning. <laughs> you know, gaming out the unexpected and, and deciding what we would do in those uh, circumstances. Now, you know, we, it was not unexpected what happened in Libya, but I do think it suffered for some of that, that same sort of, um, you know, happy planning of, well, well, we'll change everything and then the people of the country will take over and they will, um, you know, build themselves a democracy and, and you know, we'll send but, them aid and people will, <laughs> will uh, move on. And it's but, not but, that easy. But both of you are pointing to in fact, all three of you are pointing to the importance of staying in there, staying engaged, committing resources. And yet, again, what we heard from the president in that interview is that there's no appetite for doing that domestically, either in the United <coughs> States or for that matter, Canada or any of the Western democracies. We, we also heard in so many words that the Middle East doesn't matter as much as it once did to the United States. The United States is now self-sufficient in, uh, or approaching self-sufficiency in, uh, in, uh, in energy. Um, uh, and um, one gets the sense that, you know, even the much-touted Iran agreement was part of a U.S. disengagement strategy from the region as opposed to an engagement strategy, particularly when you look at how allies have felt about, some important allies of the United States have felt about that agreement. So, the next administration, whoever it may be, he or she, uh, and I won't editorialize there as to who it should be, uh, but um, uh, should, uh, the next president, should she be more engaged <laughs> in the uh, politics and diplomacy of the Middle East? Uh, you know, have we really seen eight years of, uh, of rather desultory diplomacy when it comes to, um, you know, the uh, conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, which is chronic, um, when we see some of these other conflicts? Should we see uh, a push for engagement, and how would you sell that? <laughs> so if you get the call from Hillary, what should I do? What would you say to her? I, I don't think that President Obama was wrong to resist putting American troops on the ground in Syria. We've done that. We've done it in Afghanistan. We've done it in Iraq. We have been at war since 9-11. But he was wrong to threaten a red line and then say, oh, I didn't really mean it. Mm 
That undercuts the leverage and the reputation of the most powerful country in the world, and that's not a good thing. It's just not a good thing. So President Obama's Atlantic interview is wonderful reading, and you look at some of it and you think, boy, this guy really can think through problems. But then he said, I didn't want to do the actual red line and, and go after the Syrians after they used chemical weapons because that would have been playing the Washington playbook. Well, I know it's not polite to say it, but frankly, that is not logic, that's crap. He, what he's doing is excusing inaction because he decided he didn't want to do what all the talking heads in the think tanks had said, you've got to do it, Mr. President. The mistake he made was to actually make the threat in the first place. But I don't fault him for not intervening militarily on the ground in Syria. We've been there. And in that sense, disengagement or restraint maybe is a better term. Restraint in the Middle East. We don't need more Middle Eastern adventures with large numbers of ground troops. And Asia is actually quite important. Pamela, do you want to I pick up on I think, uh, yes, I, I probably disagree a bit here because, um, I mean, I, I, I don't think ground troops are um, called for in, in, in the Syrian uh, situation now. It's gone on too long. It, it would, um, you know, the, 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 the objectives now are, are just too muddy. Um, but we've tried benign neglect in the Middle East, and it doesn't work. Uh, you know, if you don't keep a sharp focus on um, your diplomacy in that area, and I think this is exactly where jaw-jaw is extremely important, um, then, um, you know, all sorts of bad things can happen. So I... I, I not military intervention, yes, diplomatic intervention. Um, and uh, frankly, I'd be very surprised if the United States did anything but. Um, this administration, next administration, no matter who it is. So, Andrew, I'd like you to approach that question from the point of view of Canada. Right. Uh, the policy of the current government is Canada's back in the world. Right. Does that include playing the kind of diplomatic mediation role uh, that uh, Chet and Pamela have talked to. And if the Americans don't do it, should we be picking up the slack? Um, well, I, I mean, I think, you know, the reality is, I mean, Canada just doesn't carry the same heft as the U.S. And um, rarely would we, would we go alone. Um, I think we would normally, I mean, the Canadian way, I think it would be to support larger coalitions uh, or, or multilateral efforts to um, to secure peace. Um, but what I would recommend to to all governments in the West, the new U.S. administration included, is to not. I, I wouldn't talk about disengagement with the Middle East mm -hmm. so much as revisiting how we engage with That's the right. Middle East. Right. And I would. I would challenge every government to review its arms sales to military, to Middle Eastern countries. I would definitely get the U.S., recommend the U.S. to revisit its drone policy, which I think can, is, is incredibly counterproductive. Um, simply because you, I mean, you've got populations that are living in, in terror of these drones, and you're not making any friends by doing that. So the way in which we engage with Middle Eastern countries, I think, has to change. And perhaps with the new administration in the U.S. Uh, after November, there will be an opportunity to hit the reset button. So I'd like to, uh, in, after the last question, bring our audience into the conversation. But um, there are uh, some young people in the audience I can see out there. Uh, some of you are students, some of you may in fact be considering diplomatic careers. And um, maybe the three of you, uh, as seasoned observers of uh, diplomacy and the kinds of skill sets that you need uh, to uh, 
pursue uh, diplomatic careers. Uh, what advice would you give um, students about the sorts of things they should be studying if they want, uh, if they want a, a career, whether it's in the not-for-profit sector, doing conflict resolution in troubled neighborhoods, human rights uh, advocacy, uh, or chat uh, good old-fashioned diplomacy with the State Department, or as we now call it in Canada, rather grandly, the uh, uh, Global Affairs Canada uh, Department. So why don't we start with you, Chet? You're, you're in the business, in the teaching business. Uh. Yeah, I think there are a number of skill sets that are important in diplomacy. And some of them can be learned on the ground by doing, and some of them can be learned in school. Um, to me, the most important skill set is an understanding of the history of other places, as well as yourself, your own history. Learning your own history tells you about your limits and your possibilities. Learning other people's history enables you to put your mind in the mind of the other. And if you want to be an effective diplomat, you've got to be able to get into the mind of the other. And so history was where I'd start, and my next place I'd go to is foreign languages. I come from a country which struggles with becoming a little bit bilingual uh, in certain parts of the U.S., but uh, we are isolated by the fact that we are largely a monolingual society. You need foreign languages um, in order to be able to understand the way other people think and express themselves. So those are two starting places. Mm. Pamela. I, I mean, I think there's a great difference between becoming a diplomat and working in the area of conflict resolution. Um, in the, if you are a diplomat, you are representing your country. And uh, mostly your assignment really will be to represent your country's interests wherever you are. Um, if you're in conflict resolution, you are probably representing uh, the, the objective of peace, which means that you're not on one side or the other. So to, to feel what that is like, I would recommend that as much as possible that you um, get an opportunity to practice, which doesn't mean you have to end up in a war zone. Um, there are plenty of organizations that work in your local community. Um, uh, you may be working with refugees, you may be working with people who um, are underrepresented, but as long as you get that uh, feeling of what it's like uh, not to be able to articulate your your uh, wants and needs, needing help to do that, um, what it's like for someone who's in a conflict zone. And um, it's also um, difficult to get over one's own um, in inhibitions about talking about conflict. Lots of us are not really that, that comfortable about being confrontational or or speaking truth to power, you are, because this is a human rights person is, but a lot of people who go into the conflict sphere um, you know, have, have uh, a bit of difficulty doing that. So again, just putting yourself in the situation where you actually do have to um, either represent people or, or be very articulate yourself about um, what um, the nature of the conflict is and what would help to resolve it. Andrew. Um, what I would add is, is definitely travel. And if you have the opportunity to live abroad for a, a period, uh, I, would, I would always recommend that. Um, and, and perhaps just to build on, on Chet's point about understanding history, um, I would even expand that to, to really all the liberal arts and uh, read, read the literature of, mm -hmm. from other countries. Uh, study their art, because um, I think you can, you, that's how you develop empathy and, and understanding and, and appreciation for what other cultures uh, offer. And, and I, again, I, I mentioned it earlier, I mean, we live in a world of mistrust and polarization, and, uh, and 
and that's got to change, and it's only getting worse. Um, and and I think our if it can if we continue to go down the road that we're going down, then the prospects of peace I think are are even dimmer. Well, thank you uh, very much. Um, and what I'd like to do is uh, to uh, turn things over to our audience. We uh, we do have uh, people who are watching uh, this uh, discussion on webcast, uh, doing so live. And I see we have a question from Jeff in Waterloo. What impact have data leaks had on our chaotic world, and how do you see digital security impacting the future of diplomacy? Now, we really haven't talked about tech world and digital world. Uh, there were some videos being shown beforehand uh, that actually come from the uh, website of the Global Commission on Internet Governance that were uh, uh, talking about uh, tech and its importance in today's world. But uh, what, what, how, how would you answer uh, Jeff's question? Pamela. I think we are living in a world where uh, the assumption of privacy is probably gone. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult to imagine a situation now where you can be completely confident that your, your, you know, whatever you're doing is, is private. Um, you know, we all have computers. All of our computers have cameras. Um, you know, we can um, uh, find ourselves being spied upon as easily as somebody who has um, you know, state secrets uh, in their possession. So um, I think uh, it will make, it, it, will, it will have two effects. I think it will make people more careful uh, about what they say. And, you know, I was embarrassed by our flip diplomats saying rude things about all sorts of people. I mean, everyone <laughs> says rude things about all sorts of people in the privacy of their own home, but I think that's off the table now. Mm. Um, but I also think Does it that will... extend to email servers? <laughs> <laughs> Private email server? Absolutely. <laughs> um, we won't go there. Uh, but um, I, I also think that the value of transparency, um, you know, is going gonna, is gonna to not just be something we talk about. I think it's going to be something that we are all aware of. Does it mean you can't keep secrets, Chet? And, and one used to think that diplomacy depended on secrets. I remember a crisis in the diplomacy that I was involved in in the late 1980s, and I was very anxious to get in touch real time with my Soviet counterpart. And I arranged to get his cell phone number, and I got him in the middle of a meeting. He was sitting in the Soviet embassy in Brussels. <coughs> and he was stunned to receive an open line cell phone call from his American counterpart. That's how things have changed so much today. That would probably not happen so much anymore. Um, people are much more careful about what they say and, and much more constrained. You don't put much on paper anymore, but the immediate impact of it, and that's what the question asks, is that you dry up your sources People don't trust you. People are much more nervous than they used to be about talking to a, an American official, just to take that example. Because they know that we have an inability to keep secrets in Washington. Washington's a place of Xerox machines, and it's a place of leaks, and it's a place of internecine warfare between competing executive branch departments, to say nothing of, of the Congress and the media. So, you, you clam up. Yeah, we don't know about such things in Ottawa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to uh, open things up for our audience. Would anybody like to uh, pose a question, uh, either to the panel as a whole or to a particular member of the panel? <laughs> and please, uh, we have a mic over there, we have a mic there, and uh, <laughs> uh, just say who you are. That would be helpful. Um, so that we know who's asking the question. And the young lady, uh, Mike on my left. 
table where the mediation is taking place are legitimate representatives and are acting in good faith. And I'll, I'll be more practical to kind of give you an idea of where I'm coming from, but I'm thinking of the you know, long running, uh, as you mentioned, chronic Israel-Palestine peace process where you have on one hand the Palestinian Authority, which is not seen, widely seen, as a, as a legitimate representative of um, the Palestinian people, and then you have the Israeli government on the other hand that is continuing to build settlements, you know, while the peace processes are going on, which are um, by and large seen as the greatest obstacles to a peaceful resolution in Israel and Palestine. And your name is? Sorry, my name is Zainab. Um, I'm the coordinator here of the local social service organization. Thank you, Zainab. That's an excellent question. Who'd like to take that on? Pamela, if you want uh, responsibility to, uh, uh, to insist on some sort of legitimacy or some sort of seriousness on the part of the parties. It, was that your question? Responsibility as well as your ability to actually do so, some legitimate representation. Um, well, I will, I, I mean, you know, I, I'd, I'd certainly turn to the diplomat to answer this question, but I teach mediation. Um, and, you know, one thing I say to my students is, you know, y you deal with the parties that, that show up. You can do your best to uh, try to convince the parties that they should send somebody who is able to make commitments and who is serious about negotiation. But if the parties have decided they want to talk to each other and they want to talk through you, in some ways, um, you have to either decide um, this is not worth my time because they're not serious, or I will try my best to get some kind of, uh, you know, uh, of momentum going between these parties who show up. Um, I mean, you know, Israel-Palestine, has it, that's a very long and tractable conflict. They've heard everything that the other side has to say so they could almost represent the other side word for word. So a lot of that is, is simply um, there to, be, to, to show their constituency either that they are or not, are not negotiating. Chuck? You know, I think the issue is whether um, the US government, for example, is well advised to engage in Israeli Palestinian talks under these circumstances. Why? Because the PA doesn't represent all of the Palestinian voices and because the government of Israel is not interested and is in fact expanding the problem and making the problem worse. So is it wise to engage? I mean, we all want peace in the Middle East and Shimon Peres has said it best. He said, we all know there's light at the end of the tunnel. The problem is there's no tunnel. <laughs> and there's no tunnel as long as you've got characters like that in charge. So if I were advising the next administration in Washington, and I'm sure I will not be invited to do so, <laughs> I, I would not engage in, Arab, in Israel Palestinian peacemaking unless some fundamental things change. Otherwise, we become part of the problem between Israel and the Palestinians, instead of part of the solution. So is there a role for diplomacy there at all, as things stand right now? Well, for mitigation of the conflict, uh, the conflict uh, impact on the ground, yes. Humanitarian and other. Uh, capacity building, that sort of thing. And some of that might be track two efforts to build some capacity. Some of that is going on. A lot of it is going on, and I think that's, that's worthy stuff. But that's not the big picture negotiation. That's preparing the table for the future. And if you could identify yourself, please. Definitely. My name is Kara Clausen, and I work for an international economic development organization based here in um, Kitchener-Waterloo. But I've studied conflict resolution and mediation in various parts of my life, so this topic is of great interest to me. And I've done a lot of reading on how global, how peace building is not just about that actual act of conflict resolution and peace building, but it's much more comprehensive. 
whether it's you know building better business, enabling environments for businesses to thrive, or environmental sustainability. And I'm just wondering, I have two questions. What, what role does, does diplomacy have in some of those other things that doesn't, I mean, we've talked a lot about peace building and conflict resolution and bringing two parties together and mediating, but there's a lot of other work that needs to be done too in order for peace to last. Because as one of you said, after five years, often, you know, even after a peace process, countries will fall back into, into conflict. And some, some studies have said that that's because of their economic instability as well. So that would be my first question. Where does that where, what role does that play? What recognition of those other issues? And then secondly, how can we start measuring and what types of measurement tools are you developing to, to begin be, to be able to predict where conflict might arise? You talk about early warning signs, but other tools that might be able to predict that and I know there's lots of big data stuff out there, so wondering what kind of uh, work you've done in that too. Thank you. So Pamela, I'll let you take the first question and maybe Andrew, you can sure. take the second question. And maybe you want to start with the second question. Why don't we start with the second question? Yeah. <laughs> um, sure, um, well there, there are a lot of, uh, there's, there is a lot of, of work being done at the UN right now to, um, to deal with questions of, of prevention and early warning signs. And, and uh, what, what's happening is that they, um, the, the people who are in, say, the Office for the Prevention of Genocide um, are looking at a whole slew of indicators that could uh, be an indication of a mass atrocity that's coming down, uh, down the line. One, I think, very concrete example of this is a rise in xenophobia and, and hate propaganda. And what we're starting to see is the development of um, mechanisms, uh, accountability mechanisms, and special pre procedures in the UN, within the UN, right, UN human rights system that are, are really keeping a close eye on this. And um, many see something like hate propaganda as really the canary in the mine shaft. And so the, at least in the theory, is that if we see this happening, um, then there could be steps taken to perhaps uh, mitigate, or at the very least denounce those who are advocating hate. And, you know, and, and unfortunately, I think we're seeing lots of evidence that there's, there's more and more hate propaganda out there. Um, so that would be, I think, a very concrete example of some, of, a, uh, of an indicator that, that many are hanging their hat on as a, an early warning sign of some big trouble coming down the road. Um. I'll get to the specific answer to your question, but I just want to, to report on what we've been doing here for the last two days. We had a, a meeting where we were um, bringing people from um, Africa, from here, from the United States, from other places, to talk about an issue um, of uh, Africa's uh, capacity um, to resist and recover from conflict, to resist conflict and to recover uh, from conflict. And um, in this conference, we really weren't talking about high politics. We were talking about all sorts of different sectors. We were talking about law. We were talking about education, civil society, media. Uh, we were talking about the components that form social attitudes. And um, we have a chapter on economics. Unfortunately, that person uh, wasn't able to come. But again, another very important sector. Uh, what is private business doing? in a post-conflict uh, situation. So I think we've gotten a lot smarter about understanding the role that wider society plays in uh, a post-conflict period. You have a peace agreement. Even in the peace agreement, you have to recognize there, have to, there has to be some implementation that goes beyond just the political settlement. 
Um, you have to establish some benchmarks, et cetera. But you also have to make an effort to engage with these different sectors. So you're not just uh, uh, you know, saying, okay, parties, you've agreed, you know, we, will, we will help you keep to your political agreements. If you're there as a mediator or as an outside friend of any kind, uh, you need to stay engaged and you need to get out into the wider public to see you know, what, uh, how these other institutions can help. So the area that you're in, obviously, is very critical. I'd like to uh, take a question from Susan in Ottawa. Do you see the role and nature of sanctions evolving as a diplomatic tool? Chet, that's, perhaps you could uh, take that question yeah. on. Yeah, there's been a lot of evolution uh, in the use of sanctions and in the type of sanctions that are being applied by, by governments. I think there's been a lot of learning in this area. So, for example, we don't do anywhere near as much what is called comprehensive uh, economic sanctions today. We don't do trade and investment sanctions as much as we did in the past. We tend to do more targeted sanctions that are targeted um, financial sanctions in many cases, uh, aimed at having a specific impact on specific actors. Sometimes we name who they might be, and we do that, for example, with Vladimir Putin's cronies, his colleagues, his oligarch colleagues, uh, we, we try to actually go after them. Uh, similarly, we go after the, the families of dictators who desire to have uh, visas to study abroad and visit their money. Um, uh, you know, uh, so, so we actually, we're getting smarter about this. And I think if you look at the recent um, uh, nuclear deal with Iran, uh, the sanctions that were applied on Iran were really devastating to its economy, and they were multilateral, not unilateral. Unilateral sanctions don't work very well, but multilateral sanctions can, can have an effect. A final point, I think that sanctions are more effective before you apply them. The threat of sanctions is when you have the maximum leverage. You look at the bad actor or the target, whatever you want to call him or her, let's say Bashar al-Assad, and, 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 and you say, you know what, uh, next Thursday we're going to break off your right arm, but there's an alternative. <laughs> but once you actually apply the sanctions, you've lost some of your leverage. You've lost probably 80% of it, because the only leverage you have left is the leverage that comes from withdrawing the sanctions again. And that's hard, that's tricky. I'd like to take another question from the audience. Uh, you, sir. Yeah, my name is Zachary. I'm a CG scholarship student here and PhD at York. I, I have two questions, basically. One is the question of leadership, and I'm really interested to understand one of the intri intriguing diplomatic uh, situations for me is the question of the Saharawi, of Western Sahara, and, and the Polisario. Uh, what aspects other than leadership really determine a negotiator's capacity to move the processes forward? And two, if leadership is key, what traits of the leadership do you, are you interested in? And I'm bringing this in relation to the question of Burundi. My president of Uganda is now was appointed, was elected maybe to be the leader to negotiate in Burundi. But if you look at the historical context in Burundi, you realize that Burundi's president Nkuruziza was changing the constitution in order to remain in power. Now you are appointing Museven, who has also changed his own constitution to extend his lifespan in power. Wouldn't it have been better, for example, to pick a leader like Tanzania, which have at least had a fair transparency in their political processes. So what aspects of leadership really matter in the diplomatic uh, negotiations? Thank you. Chet, that sounds like a question for you. <laughs> well, and maybe Princeton Lyman, who's a very distinguished American diplomat, who's also part of our project. Princeton, I don't know if you'd like to help Chet out on a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> The Western Sahara, uh, 
the, the UN plan for the Western Sahara is unworkable, and it's been unworkable since it was first put forward in 1991. Why? Because it says there should be a referendum about whether or not the Western Sahara inhabitants should be independent or should be part of Morocco. And Morocco is in a position to stack the deck and to prevent a genuine referendum from taking place. Morocco came into Western Sahara, took it over, occupied it, owned it fair and square, right? It did just what we did in the Panama Canal back during the time of Teddy Roosevelt. Um, they're not going to give it up. The only way to solve the Western Sahara problem is to have a negotiation between Algeria and Morocco, because Algeria is sustaining the Polisario movement. It's, it's, it's a, it's a logjam. You can't solve it any other way that I can think of. But when it comes to the issue of leaders and leadership, I, I, I think back to the history of, of, of my country, and I think how amazing it was that George Washington decided not to go for a third term. You know, I mean, that was really something, and it horrified his colleagues. His colleagues went after him and said, but you can't do that, <laughs> because we're going to lose our jobs, right? <laughs> and that's what happened. That's what happened to Alexander Hamilton. If you have all seen the play, it's, it, it's, it's an extraordinary story. And there are African leaders, as there are leaders in other, other regions, who get the point and who step down and don't seek to be kind of president for life, or to get their sons and daughters to take over the country. Um, and the only, the only way you can s deal with that problem is through external leverage. External leverage. Cut off the aid. A question from Evan in Cambridge. Do you think Canadian content regulations limit our ability to build empathy for others via the arts. How can we encourage broader cultural exposure and empathy? Now, I don't think it would be fair to put that question to our American friends. <laughs> so, Andrew, you're it. <laughs> um, uh, I, will, I will confess I don't know enough about our own uh, regulations around this, but we do live in an age where we can access any uh, arts from, from all over the world. And so um, I mean, if we wanted to, 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 to see a movie from China, that would be very easy. Um, so I'm not sure that in, in this day and age, in year 2016, that uh, these regulations are perhaps as restrictive as they may once have been. But I'm, I'm, that's just my guess. Thank you. Uh, I'll take uh, one more question from the audience, and uh, you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Joseph Wall, community worker here in Kitchener. Uh, first, I wanted to commend uh, the panel uh, for this uh, performance evaluation of uh, diplomacy in the context of uh, a global world today. Uh, what I would like to maybe to uh, hear from them as final thoughts uh, to add to uh, the presentation and the exchange they have made is, one, uh, the P5, the permanent members, the Security Council. Uh, we could see a concern for our global community in the way they show disinterest in our global affairs. And one would want to say that uh, to our American friends, we see this happening a lot when we see Democrats coming to power. They become more concerned of domestic issues in the United States. And these situations happen, the human rights violations, uh, the autocratic and, 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 uh, and, and dictators continue to violate human rights and abuses 
and a lot of killings. And they don't also commit, some leaders don't commit to the agreement they have signed. And we have this human migration, which is an issue today. And hunger and displacements, internally displaced people, and death of people. Should it become Democrats again, what do you think as a global community? Interested organizations and communities, what approach do you think would be the best to help the coming governments of the United States being a key player. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I guess a part of that question is, are Democrats uh, born isolationists or stay-at-home conflict managers? At least I heard that uh, in part of the question. And then a more general question about global responsibility. And, uh, and engagement. So uh, maybe we'll just chat, Pamela and Andrew. Well, <clears throat> right now we have an unusual situation where we have a Democratic uh, presidential candidate who uh, is a strong internationalist and a very strong believer in, in uh, American global leadership on a whole bunch of issues, uh, a forward-leaning internationalist um, who um, uh, voted for the uh, for the Iraq war, for example, um, and who is said to have been dismayed when President Obama did not uh, go after the Syrians after they used chemical weapons. Um, so th that's, that's a fairly, now I'm not saying that Hillary Clinton wouldn't have a strong domestic program, because she will, I'm quite certain of that, but she's also an internationalist, an engager, if you like. Uh, Donald Trump, who pretends to be a Republican, um, is, is actually a, a kind of know-nothing populist uh, of the kind that we had in the 1940s who tried to keep us out of World War II. And it's very interesting that he chose the word America first to be the mantra for, for his campaign because the America firsters were sympathetic to the Nazis uh, I won't take this too much further, but I think you get my drift. Um, he, he, he doesn't want us to be a leader on a lot of things internationally. He wants to get out of trade agreements and out of NATO. And, um, you know, so so it's, it's unclear. I don't think we have a legitimate Republican candidate to, to, to talk about. What we have is, is a, um, a charlatan. Uh, Diplomatically put, Pamela. <laughs> I'm not running for office. Yeah. So. <laughs> Let me talk about North America, and it's not quite true that I'm just American, because as you know, Finn, I'm married to a Canadian, and I'm the grandmother of Canadians, so, um, <laughs> I, you know, I feel very much that we're, we're all part of Are you getting ready one, to move back? <laughs> one land, land mass. Um, uh, you know, I think it's the responsibility of both of our countries to be as engaged internationally as we can be. We're wealthy, uh, we have resources, we have ideas, and we do have empathy. I don't know about your content laws, but um, you know, <laughs> you are a very sympathetic uh, country um, and uh, have, you know, a reputation and a history of being engaged everywhere. Uh, Americans, you know, have also, particularly private Americans, have, have um, you know, quite often um, become, um, you know, very interested in parts of the world that they have nothing to do with in terms of their personal background. So, um, but I think in this day and age of um, polarization, which you brought up, it is part of our responsibility to um, try to counteract that by being, you know, a private ambassadors wherever we can. So engagement um, on part of our governments is very important, but private engagement is, is equally yeah. important. Very good. Andrew. 
Um, I'd say that, I, I mean, I think the notion that you can dis disengage with the world is just a complete fallacy. And uh, that's just not the age we live in, whether it's because of economics or climate change or migration being a good example. Um, the days of the, the, the developed world being somehow buffered from massive migration flows are over. And, uh, and, and, and not just because of conflict, but because of natural disaster as well. And so if we aren't cooperating, and if we don't have good processes in place, then at, at the very best, we will have ad hoc and knee-jerk reactions to crises, and at worst, we'll have mass atrocities. Um, so like it or not, we have to engage with each other. Otherwise, you know, we're doomed. Well, on that note, um, <laughs> Uh, please join me in thanking uh, our three panelists. I've learned a lot from this conversation. And if I'm not mistaken, is there uh, some sort of reception outside or can people congregate outside if they wish to ask further questions of our panelists? They they do have to get to an airport, but uh, we do have a few minutes. So thank you all. Thank you, uh, audience, for being uh, patient. Thank you for those uh, who ask questions. And uh, have a good evening. Um, uh, you can't uh, place those problems on the burden of the uh, chief uh, negotiator. Um, as you look back on your experience uh, uh, bringing diplomacy uh, to uh, a deeply troubled neighborhood, um, are there any lessons that are relevant to the 21st century? Uh, I don't mean to date you, uh, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, some would say, you know, we're in a completely different world. Today's conflicts are completely different from uh, the 20th century and uh, the peacemaking efforts that you were involved in. Well, I think some things, some things change and, and some things stay the same. So one lesson is you need leverage to be effective as a negotiator and a mediator. And leverage comes from coherence. You need coherence in your home institution. I spent a good deal of my time, maybe 40 or 50% of it, keeping the troops assembled and united on the home front. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. You but appeared you before the US Congress a lot of times. I remember The US you on Congress, yes. Uh, mm. People who thought the State Department's policy was getting into bed with Marxists or others who thought we were getting into bed with racists, and, and so you know, we were carrying water on both shoulders, and the media was uh, up in arms some of the time, so it was quite exciting. But then there's also coherence and leverage needed with, uh, with other players. We borrowed a lot of leverage at that time, so that's one lesson. I think it's kind of universal. We don't see much of that coherence and leverage in Syria today, mm. for example. Another lesson uh, is the vital importance of human agency. Leaders make a difference. And that's a universal lesson over time, I think. So I, I don't think it's really, you're not dating me with that, with that question. <laughs> and, um, so, so think about it in the modern context and ask yourself in Ukraine, is Vladimir Putin somebody that wants to make peace in that region or does he live on frozen or not so frozen conflict? You know, so that's, that's a lesson. A thir third lesson, and I'll stop, because <laughs> there's probably a lot of things we want to talk about. Don't give your policy a name. Now, back in the day, our policy got called constructive engagement. Mm 
And, and nothing's wrong with constructive engagement, but if you give your policy a name, people will say every time something awful happens, that's the result of constructive engagement. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I suggest that if, if diplomats are thinking about all this, just say we're conducting our policy. Don't give it a name. <laughs> we, we have a foreign minister who has given his foreign policy a name that's called responsible conviction uh, or principled conviction. So uh, maybe we'll take, uh, or ask Andrew to take that advice to, uh, to Ottawa. Sure. Uh, okay. Um, Pamela, um, you've worked uh, in the... Welcome to CG and thank you for joining us. Uh, this evening's event uh, stands at the confluence of two themes that are central, in fact, to what CG does. One is the uh, changing contours of global governance. Uh, just last week, uh, we produced uh, with Chatham House uh, a report on uh, our thoughts on the future of the governance of the internet. And one can think of many other areas in which uh, CG and others work, such as sovereign debt, in which um, the nature of the players, the number of the players, and the nature of the issue is changing, so that we now think about multi-stakeholder processes, for example, to, to govern ungoverned spaces in globalization, where previously we might have limited ourselves to a narrow range of factors. So that's one. The other is uh, work that is also uh, long-standing at CG on issues related to Africa. And in the last uh, three or four years, uh, we've been putting a point on that, and many of you might have seen some of the books and, and uh, publications that we've produced in the area of um, regional solutions um, to conflict prevention and conflict management in Africa. In fact, for the last two days, uh, a group of experts and scholars has been meeting at CG to think through the next phase of that work and, and plan a book that follows on, on a very highly regarded book on, on that subject that, that was published last year. And we, we thought we'd take advantage of the presence of many of our friends uh, to, to do an event on the future of diplomacy. Central to all of this, by the way, at CG is my colleague, uh, Fen Hampson, who's the director of our global security and, pol and uh, politics program. So Fen will be leading the way and introducing our friends and experts, and uh, I hope you enjoy the discussion. Fen. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to uh, introduce our three panelists. Uh, we're going to be having a conversation on the future of diplomacy in a chaotic world, and I can't think of three better people and more qualified people and more clever people to uh, lead our conversation. Uh, to my far right, uh, Chester Crock International, he is the co-host of Inside the Issues, CG's weekly international affairs podcast, which I think is probably where many of you uh, have seen him. He's the author and co-editor of four books, uh, Fixing Haiti, In Defense of Principles, NGOs and Human Rights in Canada, Critical Mass, The Emergence of Global Civil Society. Uh, his latest book, and I love the title, On the Side of Angels, Canada and International Human Rights Law, which will be coming out uh, sometime uh, later uh, this year. Uh, he is uh, also a senior fellow at CG and um, uh, is on the advisory editorial board of Global Civil Society uh, and uh, uh, Global Civil Society Report, um, as well as uh, many other uh, non-governmental organizations in which uh, in whose work uh, he's evolved. 
We're going to have a conversation, and then we're going to uh, invite you to uh, join the conversation. I'm going to kick it off with a few questions. I'm going to sit down uh, so that I'm not giving an exam to uh, my <laughs> colleagues. Um, and uh, 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 our dis discussion is going to be a wide-ranging one, but uh, perhaps I could begin. Uh, Winston Churchill uh, once said that jaw-jaw is better than war-war. And by that, he meant uh, diplomacy should be the preferred means of settling international disputes. Um, I guess, you know, as we look at the turbulent world we're living in and uh, the many conflicts in today's trouble spots that don't seem to be getting any better, is there enough jaw-jaw taking place? And if there isn't, why isn't it uh, taking place? So, Chet, perhaps you'd like to... Uh, uh, kick off the conversation, and then I'll invite uh, Pamela and Andrew to offer their own reflections. Well, thank you, Fenn. I guess the most important thing about diplomacy and talking to another party is not that you're talking, it's what you say to them. So jaw-jaw is kind of an open-ended idea. Um, and, and talking to adversaries, talking to difficult actors, that's okay, but you've got to figure out what you're going to say. The second point I'd make is, is that you need to have some, something behind your jaw jaw. You need to have some strength. You need to have some allies. You need to have a coalition of like-minded. And it, it helps to have a little leverage when you're doing jaw jaw. That's the way I'd start the, the conversation. Pamela, what are your thoughts? You've worked in the... Uh non-governmental civil society sector. You've uh, uh, been deployed in many hot spots around the world. Um, you've done a lot of jaw-jaw yourself. Are we doing enough jaw-jaw? <laughs> Never enough jaw-jaw. Uh. <laughs> He's a distinguished fellow with CG's Global Security and Politics Program. He also is the James R. Schlesinger Professor of Strategic Studies at Georgetown University and serves on the board of its Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. From 1981 to 1989, Chet served as Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. He was responsible for leading the diplomacy that uh, produced the treaties signed by Angola, Cuba, and South Africa in New York in December 1988. Those agreements uh, resulted in Namibia's independence and the withdrawn, uh, withdrawal of foreign forces from Namibia and Angola. Uh, Chet has had a very distinguished career. He's also served as chairman of the board of the United States Institute of Peace uh, from 1992 to 2004. Uh, he continued to serve as a board member for many years. That's where actually I first got to, uh, to know him. He served as a mediator, uh, mediation advisor in the United Nations and the State Department in uh, such places as Western Sahara, Kosovo, the Philippines, and Syria. He chairs the board of the G3 Good Governance Group and is also a founding member of the Glo Global Leadership uh, Foundation. Uh, to, uh, to Chet's left is Pamela All who is a senior fellow with CG's Global Security and Politics Program and is uh, leading our project uh, examining Af Africa's regional conflict management uh, capacities and gaps. Uh, she serves as a senior advisor uh, to the United States Institute of Peace, where she was uh, founding provost of the Institute's Academy for International Conflict Management and Peacebuilding. She's on the board of Women in International Security, a senior associate at Facilitating Peace, a consulting network of conflict resolution specialists. Uh, Pamela uh, has uh, directed conflict transformation and capacity building programs in Sudan, Iraq, Israel, Palestine, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, and Bosnia and prior to joining the United States Institute of Peace, uh, where she worked for many years, uh, she was at the Rockefeller Foundation. 
and uh, a number of other uh, international, uh, educational, and uh, 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 cultural uh, think tanks. Um, last, but by no means least, uh, Andrew Thompson, who many of you may know. Uh, he is a local in every sense of the word. Uh, he's a professor, adjunct uh, uh, professor of political science at uh, the University of Waterloo. Uh, he um, uh, is chair of uh, Amnesty International uh, Canada uh, and for many years served uh, on uh, the board of uh, Amnesty. In I mean, in some ways I, I uh, agreed with Chet um, in that, you, you know, it does depend on um, who you are and what you're saying, but um, Talking is always important, but you may not be the right person to talk. You may not have the right uh, institutional support to talk. There are lots of elements that go into this complicated mix of talking. Um, but I think, you know, in, in the end, I think we're all very much in favor of some kind of engagement, even with people you don't like. Uh, because you don't really know what they think unless you talk to them. You can read about them in the newspaper, but there's nothing like actually having a conversation. So both, both of you have talked about uh, the importance of not just talking, but stressing the importance of how you talk and who you talk to and who leads the talking. But let's try to get specific. Andrew, where do, do we need more diplomacy of the kind that Chet and Pamela have talked about, in your opinion? Is it Syria? Is it Libya, where peace process seems to be falling apart? Uh, there are many parts of the world that, uh, uh, at least in the abstract, might benefit from more jaw-jaw. But... Um, absolutely. And I'm a big fan of having normalized diplomatic relations with countries, even if you don't like them. And um, I think it, you know, Iran would be a good example. Of Iran. The, Iran, mm -hmm. where um, for decades now, really since the, the revolution of the late 70s, where the West and Iran have been at odds with each other. And there's, uh, there's mistrust in the relationship. There's a lack of empathy. And uh, reestablishing diplomatic relations uh, I think is, is absolutely crucial because you, you want to have people on the ground who can make sense of a situation for themselves and not have to rely on the Turks or the Saudis to tell you what's happening in Iran. Um, so I think you know, that would be a very concrete example of, of um, establishing strong or, or beginning the process of establishing relations with, with Iran. Cuba, I, th I would make the Cuba. same case. Um, and I think those were two very important initiatives of the, of the, in recent years. So Chet, you were actually on the ground uh, when you were Assistant Secretary of State. Uh, uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, you were the chief negotiator and architect of the Angola-Namibia Peace Accords. Um, in the uh, late 1980s, uh, those accords uh, brought peace to uh, a deeply troubled part of the African subcontinent. Uh, they've actually, unlike many peace accords, not unraveled. Uh, it's a much uh, stabler part of the world. Uh, it has other problems, 